In our ongoing series of looking at older hardware and how they perform today, just the other week we took a revisit of the Ryzen 5 1600 to see how it had aged and what the start of the upgrade path would be if you were still rocking a first generation Ryzen processor, and to see kind of how far things have come since then in comparison to the latest Ryzen 7000 Zen 4 CPUs. And while you could argue that a 1600 can be picked up fairly cheap now, if you're already using one, I guess it's fair to say that it hadn't aged that well. So how about the Ryzen 2600? Does that come in any better? Well, that's what we're gonna find out. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. I'm never gonna be an esports gamer. I never get any kills. I wouldn't be so sure of that. Is that Andy Raffel from eTechnics.com? Yes, my son, it is me, Andy Raffel from eTechnics.com. What are you doing here? I'm here to bestow upon you a gift that will transform you into a true gamer. With a 24.5 inch full HD screen, 240 hertz refresh rate, 0.5 millisecond response time, AMD FreeSync Premium, and height adjustability, you'll be gaming in the big leagues in no time. Oh, thank you. No problem, my son. Why don't you check out the link in the description below to find out more. Okay, so before we jump into the performance, let me start by saying, in case you've not seen the Ryzen 1600 video, that we are featuring the Ryzen 5 7600. Just because, firstly, we already had all of the testing data, and secondly, it just makes sense. Because as we're looking at the 600 series of products, such as the 1600, 2600, and then the 3600 being next, it makes sense to get an idea of the upgrade path and kind of what's available to you. Also, don't worry, as we get to the 5000 series, we will be including the 5800X3D, which before I've even tested, to me, just makes the most sense if you're clinging onto the older platform and you know don't wanna look at going down the Zen 4 with DDR5 route. So as we draw kind of further into these revisits and comparisons, things should start to tell a bit of a story about what the best move is depending on the CPU that you're currently running. And of course, the big thing, your budget. Also, a quick caveat, we've done all of our testing with the RTX 4090. Not because it's a GPU that you'd likely use with one of these older CPUs, but to just really eliminate any form of bottleneck that the CPU might actually provide. Now, I do wanna see, I guess, how far each CPU can be pushed with no barriers in its way. So for testing, the Ryzen 2600 was tested in our AM4 test bench, which consists of a Gigabyte X570S Aorus Master with 32 gig of Kingston Fury Renegade RGB 3600 MHz CL16 memory. Our Ryzen 5 1600 was used on the slightly older Gigabyte X470 Aorus Gaming 7 Wi-Fi due to limitations with CPU support and the same Kingston memory was used. Now for the Ryzen 5 7600, we used the Gigabyte X670E Aorus Master, and due to it being DDR5 based, we used 32 gig of G-Skill Trident Z5 Neo 6000 MHz CL30 memory. Also, as I mentioned, we're using the Inno 3D RTX 4090 iChill X3OC to eliminate any bottlenecks and to push each CPU as far as we can. All of our tests were done on the latest update of Windows 11 and with each system's latest respective motherboard BIOS version. To get the best idea in terms of how the 2600 will perform, we put it through its paces on a total of 42 games, of which we'll look at about 15 or so today before taking a look at the percentage differences against the Ryzen 7600, which should give us some idea as to the generational growth of how far kind of things have come from the 2600 all the way up to the 7600. Though if you want to see the charts for all 42 games, you can do so over on our Patreon, where you'll get a ton of other cool goodies, including exclusive behind the scenes content, access to our bi-weekly game nights, and it helps support the channel like you wouldn't believe. The link for all that great stuff is down below. So that aside, let's get into those glorious benchmarks. Kicking things off with a Plague Tale Requiem, and from the very start, we can see how limited the Ryzen 2600 is at just 92 FPS. While it is a 9% improvement over the first generation 1600, it's still not a match for a modern day CPU like the 7600, which sits 83% ahead at 169 FPS, with a 1% low figure that beats the average of the second generation CPU. As we move up in resolution, it's only really at 4K where the GPU starts to take over and all CPUs come within 8% of each other, but already the 2600 isn't off to the best start. It's a similar story in Baldur's Gate 3 where we see 15% more performance over the Ryzen 1600, but the Zen 4 CPU that we've included for comparisons still commands a 54% improvement and holds a similar position throughout all three resolutions. 
while the 2600 still keeps a similar lead over the first generation 1600. Call of Duty shows a smaller improvement moving from the 1600 to the 2600 at 160 FPS at 1080p, but it's still no match for the latest generation, which comes in 44% faster. While the gap does shrink at the higher resolutions, there isn't a great deal in it between the first and second generation CPUs. And then, as expected at 4K, we see the results draw closer to the Zen 4 counterpart. Cyberpunk on the Ultra preset shows that even at 1080p and with an RTX 4090, the Ryzen 5 2600 still falls short. And while you can happily game at 50fps, most gamers crave at least 60, and the limitations are really holding it back, as the arguably mid-tier 7600 comes in with 104% faster performance at the lower resolution, while the 2600 is noticeably held back at all three resolutions, though it does still see an uplift of about 25% over the Ryzen 5 1600. Enabling ray tracing and we see the performance drop by around 16% while the newer Zen 4 chip takes a bit more of a noticeable hit due to having higher performance to start with, but still sits 85% ahead of the Ryzen 5 2600. The gap between the 2600 and 1600 is now smaller at around 13%, so not as big of a generational uplift if you're on the original Zen architecture. When we move over to F1 23, it's a game that can give extremely high FPS figures, and while the 2600 comes in at 166 FPS at 1080p, it's no match for the Ryzen 5 7600, which is now 130% faster. What's also interesting is that both the 2600 and the older 1600 came in within margin of error results of each other at around 162 to 167 FPS, showing that F1 really does falter when it's hit with CPU limitations. It's very much the same story as we move up to the ultra high preset which enables ray tracing, where the 1600 actually pushes ahead, albeit by a 3% margin, so it could be deemed as margin of error. The 7600 still manages to squeeze out another 97% more frames at 205 FPS compared to the 104 on the 2600, showing that these older processors really do struggle in these newer titles, especially when ray tracing is involved. Moving on to Far Cry 6 and we still have some pretty big bottlenecks on both of the older CPUs. Things have been restored slightly with a 10% uplift in performance over the 1600, but generation to generation you just expect a slightly bigger jump. Whereas moving forward three more generations sees a staggering 121% more performance overall, and really kind of shows the age of these older platforms. Enabling ray tracing sees similar performance gaps of 13% over the 1600, and the 7600 still manages to push out 105% more frames overall when looking at 1080p. The performance is playable all the way up to 4K, which is nice, but the 4090 really is being held back quite dramatically at this point, even at 4K where the CPU takes less of the strain. Hogwarts Legacy on the 1600 fell just below the 60 FPS threshold that most gamers crave, while the 2600 picks up the slack ever so slightly, but even then it's evident to see the way that the CPU is holding back the whole system as the 2600 frankly runs out of steam. It does seem that newer games don't see as much of an uplift in performance gen to gen until we reach Zen 4 levels of performance, where we're seeing well over 100% in extra performance, though that does come at a cost of upgrading and changing platform including memory. Ray tracing on Hogwarts sees the 2600 coming in 31% faster than the older Ryzen 5 1600, though if you're after a fluid gameplay experience, then it's clear to see that the extra 62% performance from the Ryzen 5 7600 is the way to go, as it hits well over 60 FPS. Though as we can see from the 1080 and 1440p performance, it's still holding back performance on our RTX 4090 quite a bit, while 4K sees very similar performance on both the 7600 and 2600. Moving on to Spider-Man, and again, being a newer title, we really start to see how much the older technology is held back. The 1600 and 2600 come in with very similar performance, separated by just a few frames at all three resolutions. While newer tech, like the 7600, starts to really push ahead with up to 95% extra performance at the more CPU intensive resolution. It's the same again when we enable ray tracing, the first gen and second gen CPUs are 4 to 5 FPS apart, which is about an 8% margin, so not much at all, whereas the 7600 pushes out a huge 91% extra frames at 1080p and keeps up the trend into the higher resolutions as well, with similar performance across the board. Ratchet & Clank gives some odd results which actually sees our 1600 performing better, albeit as margin of error. The gap does widen to 11% at 4K and sees the 7600's performance drop quite dramatically too, though the margins are still pretty big, and gives us an idea as to how much extra performance an upgrade would actually give you.
Enabling ray tracing drops performance as expected, though the drop is slightly larger, around 23% for the 7600 at 1080p. Performance on the 2600 and 1600 is still very similar, with just a single FPS between them, though again the 2600 falls slightly at the higher resolutions. Even with that, the 7600 still manages to push another 70% more performance at 1080p. Starfield is still extremely popular and gives us pretty typical results that we'd expect, moving from one generation to the next. The 2600 sees a sizable 33% increase in performance, which edges just beyond 60 FPS and manages to hold that CPU limiting performance across all resolutions. While the 7600, which is still held back when we compare 1080 to 1440p performance, sees another 100% more performance at 1080p, which sees the gap draw closer at 4K, but we're still talking 54% more frames at the highest resolution tested. So some pretty big numbers, and it gives us a kind of general idea as to how much extra performance an upgrade to a 7600 would actually give us, and also as to how capable the 2600 is in modern games. Now I think it's pretty clear to see that the 2600 is still man enough in certain games, and where it falls short, it's nothing that a simple tweak of the settings can't do to bring extra performance to the table. Though we have to remember, we tested using an RTX 4090, so should you really be expected to dial things down a little to get extra performance that is very clearly there in the first place, with the CPU just holding you back somewhat? I also get that the 7600 isn't as simple as just dropping it in, as it does incorporate quite a sizable investment with a new CPU, new motherboard, and new memory. But I guess the saying of evolve or get left behind is, I don't know, quite fitting. Now to get a better idea as to how much performance you'll be getting by upgrading from the 2600 to the 7600, we actually tested the processors in 42 games to see what kind of uplifts we were able to get that give us, a, I guess, a much bigger picture. It's here where the 7600 comes in 102% faster overall at 1080p, with the smallest margin coming by the way of Dying Light 2 at just 35% and the highest from Doom Eternal with the 7600 coming in a staggering 152% faster overall. Now for the most part though, we have 22 games in total that come in over 100% faster on the newer Zen 4 CPU when compared to the Ryzen 2600, and only three that are actually less than a 50% gain, which is, I guess, still impressive. So I guess you could argue it kind of either way to a degree, as there is a much heftier cost involved with a complete platform change. But for over 100% faster performance in the majority of games, I think it's safe to say that it is actually worth it. Though I am going to milk this slightly by saying that the 5800X3D is really going to throw a spanner into the mix, and something that we will be comparing to the 7600 in an upcoming piece of content. So make sure you subscribe for that. Now, the other thing that we wanted to include, based on feedback from you guys, is power consumption. Because with more power comes, well, more power. Now, when you have a product that delivers more performance, it's naturally going to use more power, and that's evident to see across a small selection of the games that we tested. For the most part, we saw the newer and more powerful 7600 using anywhere from 10% more power in the likes of Hogwarts Legacy with RT enabled, to 31% more power in Starfield, which for me personally, I'm okay with. 31% more power for 100% more performance. And even then, the 31% more power is only actually 21 watts in total, so nothing of huge significance. Now with great power comes great temperatures, and for the most part the trend of which games use more power is also reflected in the temperatures, as you'd expect, which kind of I guess just makes sense anyway. Now Starfield is the top one, where the 7600 comes in 29 degrees warmer, though it's still a comfortable 80 degrees C while other games trickle down in the low to mid 70s when looking at Spider-Man, Baldur's Gate 3 and Ratchet and Clank, though we then see a sizable gap before we get to the kind of likes of Hogwarts, Far Cry 6 and A Plague Tale at around 62 degrees. Now the 2600 though is I guess much more consistent in terms of temperatures, sitting mostly between 45 and 51 degrees with one outlier at 43 degrees being Far Cry 6. Though it's very clear to see that the 2600 is the cooler running of the two processors, and again by quite some margin. But again, 102% more performance overall. I think it's a sacrifice you'd have to make. So yeah, some pretty interesting results, and it has allowed us to collect more data so that we can get to our end goal of seeing what the right upgrade path is, no matter whether you're on a first gen or a second gen Ryzen, though of course we do have the 3600 coming up soon too. Now I definitely think the performance is 
fairly strong in older titles, but it's very clear to see that we're just on the cusp of losing the momentum when it comes to newer games. And this is only going to get worse as newer titles hit the market that push the boundaries of performance. And that's, I think, where we're going to start to see the performance drop quite dramatically on these older parts. Now, in terms of value for money, the 2600 was fairly decent at the time of launch and was a huge step up from the first generation. And to be fair, you can actually get it for a fairly reasonable price these days. But not just talking about terms of performance, but the 2600 in terms of functionality too, namely when it comes to memory support, was a huge step up from first gen Ryzen. Now, I am expecting similar from the 3000 series, but for me, the 5000 series, especially in terms of 3D vCache, like the 5800X 3D, is where AMD really started to come into their stride. And obviously this has been improved upon massively in the latest iteration, like the 7800X 3D. Still though, the cost of a complete platform change I get will be a huge sticking point for most. And that's where I'm keen to see what the 5800X 3D can do to cling on to performance for as long as possible, with the cheapest cost to change. Especially as it's hard to ignore that AM4, even though you could say it's a dead platform in terms of nothing new coming beyond the rumoured 5700X3D and 5500X3D, which are likely chips that just didn't make the cut to be higher end models, I think it's very hard to deny what it has to offer, as long as performance is still king, and how that compares in kind of terms of value for money. While we've not shown the 5800X3D yet and compared it as part of our upgrade path content, it's getting there. And as you can appreciate, testing 42 games at three resolutions per CPU means that it all does take quite a bit of time to collate the data. What is interesting is if you let me know in the comments section below, did you ever have a Ryzen 2600 or even a 1600 or 3600? And kind of where are you now? I know quite a few people who actually went from a 2600 to the 3600 and they've actually sat there for quite some time not knowing quite where their next move is after. Also, if you're currently on Intel, do you regret the decision of going Team Blue, considering how long each platform typically lasts? Because that really is the major selling point of AM4. And while after speaking to AMD directly, they are all about AM5 and Zen 4 now, I think AM4 still has quite a way to go in terms of longevity. For now, that's gonna wrap this one up. Hopefully you enjoyed this little nostalgic look at older hardware. Like I said, it's an opening to some other cool content that's coming in the near future, so make sure you're subscribed for that. Also, if you love this video, then you can help support the channel over on Patreon, where you get a ton of cool perks, including behind the scenes content, access to all of the charts, bi-weekly game nights, meetups, and a super special area over on our Discord. And beyond that, it does help us out like you wouldn't believe. The link for all that cool stuff is, as always, down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.